Hey everyone, how are you? Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to be back here with story of nearly everything. It took us a long time because uh, a series of this nature. If I really wanted to work, I need to be thorough with my own preparation. I cannot afford to present you half-baked material. Right? So uh, I hope you do not uh, give a lot of weightage to the delay and uh, focus more on the effort here. All right. Uh, so today, for today's lecture, we have something which is important uh, now and its importance is going to increase as we move forward. UPSC has been asking us questions around this, this theme since, uh, you know, a lot of time. Which is that concept which I'm talking about? What is that concept? Let's uh, start unfolding the story, right? Let's start unfolding the story here of uh, environmentalism, Pariyavaranavad, right? To put it in Hindi. We are going to understand how it has originated, what are the, you know, various aspects of it, what are the current trends in it, etc., etc., etc. The first question that you should ask is, why right now? And be answered by this slide. This is Sundarlal Bahuguna, one of the most important environmental activists of India. He recently passed away. In May 2021, uh, Sundarlal Bahuguna, he passed away. And uh, with his demise, an era of envir environmentalism has ended. He was the face of Indian environmentalism in so many ways. So keeping that thought in mind, we thought that maybe we should give you some sense of how things have developed. And our objective will be to somewhere uh, focus on an essay type question and understand it in a very free flowing story way. Right? So keeping all those objectives in our head right in front of us. Aye baat ko aage badhata hu. This is a map which indicates uh, where did the uh, you know, agriculture began after the Pleistocene, Ice Ages. Early agriculture, early farming communities were placed somewhere like this. Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent, Indus Valley, Huangho. This is where the early Bronze Age civilizations appear, don't they? The most interesting part is that these civilizations, the recent studies, recent uh, data, all that indicates that these Bronze Age civilizations, they all declined in around 2200. This is precisely when even the Harappan cities, they start to show signs of abandonment. And around this time period, around 2200 BCE, all these regions, they indicate uh, a sense of decline. Why? The scientists have identified the reason is a 200 year old, 200 year long mega drought, 200 year long mega drought. It happened around 2200 BCE, that is around 4200 years ago. It is called as 4.2 kilo year event. Right, it is called as 4.2 kilo year uh, event. And it is this 500 year old mega drought which started the you know, decline of these civilizations. And it also started the Meghalayan age of Holocene. Please go and read a couple of articles around this. Right? Please go and do that. Now the point which I am trying to explain to you here is 
that environment even then was playing a decisive role in the rise and fall of civilizations. In case of Harappa also, the 4.2K BP event played an important role, may have played an important role. A lot of scholars further argue that one specific reason for the decline of Harappan civilization could have been a very intensive lumberjacking operation, tree felling, tree cutting, because they were making those wonderful bricks. So they needed uh, you know, logs of wood for fire in those kilns for baking those bricks. They used a lot of, uh, you know, uh, pastures for grazing and cut a lot of trees. And all that may have also been a reason behind the decline of uh, civilization. So do you realize civilization and, and its environment, they have been intertwined since ever. Ye koi aaj ka phenomena nahi hai. In olden times, I'm sure you must have come across such data that river course shifted and the city was destroyed. So environment, the societies, the groups who are able to live sustainably in those environments, they are the ones who thrive. Others decline. A very important lesson as we proceed ahead in this journey. Right? Okay. One of the earliest environmentalists that we encounter, not only in India, but across the globe, one of the earliest environmentalists is Lord Mahavi, Vardhaman Mahavi. He postulated that every living being has a jiva, and every jiva is equally important, equally precious. Even plants have jiva. And you must not get into any form of violence, physical, mental, verbal. So Mahavir, he can be definitely considered as one of the earliest historical environmentalists. I'm sure you know this. One of these, uh, you know, uh, your uh, sex of uh, giants, Shwetambar, one of the subsects of Shwetambar, they wear a muhupatti. They wear a muhupatti so that they do not mistakenly kill a passing, uh, you know, bacteria or an insect. And now we are today wearing masks to ensure we do not get killed. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so uh, this, is, uh, this is a very fascinating way to look at Mahavi. He was an environmentalist. As we keep moving, as we keep moving, the next very intriguing personality that you encounter is this fellow. He is Guru Maharaj Jambaji. from uh, Marwad region, Jodhpur region. Maharaj Jambaji, he came up with his own precepts, 29 precepts. Bis no Bishnoi, that's the name. So he came up with his 29 precepts. Where he showcased, he was a very sharp guy it seems. He understood the connection between uh, you know, trees and uh, sustainability of uh, the human communities. He understood it. Among his 29 precepts, if you read them, some of them are immediately clear that what this fellow is trying to achieve. For example, he is saying, be compassionate towards all living beings. That's one, right? Second, do not cut green trees. Do not sterilize bulls. 
common shelter must be created for sheep and goats called as thart so that they cannot be slaughtered non veg must be avoided the wildlife must be protected and do not use meal the dye to color your cloth blue why because indigo the dye jise neel kehte hain it is manufactured by cutting those indigo trees so he say do not color your uh, uh, cloth blue very very fascinating this bishnoi faith it was established in 15th century right and it survived and flourished and in that jodhpur desert region this bishnoi people they managed to create a very wonderful luxuriant forest space for themselves in 1730 the maharaja of jodhpur he wanted to have a palace built and he sent his guards to fell certain trees inhone kaha jao yaar zara kuch ped kaat ke le aao khejri ke get some khejri trees his guards went to khejrali village and they started felling trees local village women led by Amrita Devi Bishnoi, right? She started along with other female and kids. She started hugging those trees. The gods, they started slaughtering people. Three sixty, more than three sixty people were killed. The Maharaja finally came and apologized and declared the entire community area region. as a protected area and this legislation still exists you cannot cut a tree there it is this spirit of bishnoi which will serve as an inspiration for the coming times it served as an inspiration for chitko andolan as well right so the bishnoi struggle that is definitely one landmark in environmentalism in india right okay now uh, i'm coming to more recent times as you can sense i'm coming to more recent time this is post industrialization world which i'm now going to be talking about all right uh, the thing is Uh, i just thought that as i am beginning to talk here i should maybe also give you an understanding of social movements sociologists they say that social movements can be categorized as old and new the old social movements they focused on the field sphere of politics voting rights proper representation sovereignty etc the old in uh, social movements the new social movements are not for political rights it is more for uh, cultural social assertion for example gay movements lgbtq movements environmentalism is if you look at it environmentalism has both old social movement features and new social movement features as well in new social movement a lot of grassroots level thing happens and in old social movement a lot of political activities and bills and legislations are passed environmentalism in the context of india has features of both old social movement a new social movement just keep this uh, understanding at the back of your massive industrialization started happening in the wake of the second world war 
right? And uh, pretty soon, by 60s, people started seeing the harmful effects. Air started getting massively polluted. Thames, Rhine, these, these rivers, they were fast turning into sewers. That was the first time when people woke up to the harms of this continuous uh, uh, resource consumption, which industrialization proliferates. In this context, there are four global events which took place. And they proved to everybody that the environmental crisis, it somewhere needs to be at the center stage of the discussion. What were those four events? I want to enlist and discuss them with you. So these four global events, they brought the agenda of environmental protection right at the center stage. Kya thai? Aos right bar dekhte hain. In 1972, United Nations organized a conference on human environment. This is known as the Stockholm Conference. Just after that, a report was released called as Limits to Growth. Limits to Economic Growth. This report convinced a lot of people that the time to act is absolutely right here. Finally, in 1987, Plant Land Commission, it submitted its own report, which was titled, Our Common Future. It also highlighted the connectivity of the entire globe here, while facing such environmental concerns. It highlighted that we cannot think any longer in those divisive way, West, East, developed, developing, Third World, North, South. It highlighted and stressed that we need to come up with a comprehensive strategy and go, uh, you know, for an all-out struggle. Brunt Land Commission, a landmark. Finally, the fourth event. In 1992, Rio de Janeiro, Earth Summit was organized. A very landmark event again. This is where Agenda 21 was formulated. Forest principles, they were postulated. The Convention on Biological Diversity was opened for, uh, you know, signing. Right? The Framework Convention on Climate Change that also emerged in 92 after the Earth Summit. All right. Okay. Now let's get to a bit more focus on India. Okay. Now let's focus more on the developments of India. There's a person known as Meera Ben. Meera Ben, she is also known as uh, uh, Madeline. Madeline. So uh, she was a huge disciple of uh, uh, Gandhi and she came to India and uh, after independence she decided to move to uh, Uttarakhand and she stayed there throughout the 50s right and uh, where she did a lot of experiments on sustainable ways uh, and trying to live a you know life close to nature etc on Gandhian principles. Then in 1959, she went away, uh, right? During her stay here in, uh, you know, Himalayas, she noticed the massive tree felling which was going on. And she was also able to understand that this is going to cause a lot of flooding in the plains. She wrote an essay on it in 1950, 
you know, nine, she wrote an essay, essay on it, which is called as uh, Something Wrong in Himalayas. Something Wrong in Himalayas. But our political class, our forest department, they did not take notice of what she has said. And gradually what she said, it started becoming painstakingly clear in front of our eyes. I'm sure you guys have uh, heard about, uh, you know, Ramchandra Guha, a very wonderful historian. So this fellow, Ramchandra Guha, he says that in 1973, she's, I mean, he's very specific here. He's saying that in 1973, Three things, three events happened in India which brought environment in front of people as an important agenda. What are those three important events? Let me, let me just quickly share them with you. He's saying in 1973, in April 1973, the government of India was pressurized by NGOs, uh, the environmental conservationists, the other activist groups, World Wildlife Fund, IUCN, International Union for Conservation of uh, Nature. Right? So all these guys, they pressurized the government to launch project Tiger to save our national animal from extinction. It was launched in 1973. And government, under a lot of duress, declared a lot of uh, regions as national parks, sanctuaries, etc. All right, so this is somewhere the beginning of certain political social actions. Project Tiger, 1973. Next event with Ram, which Ramchandra Guha is highlighting, he's saying that a person by the name of B.B. Vora, a very senior bureaucrat, he wrote an article in EPW where he said that, uh, you know, soil erosion Water logging, these are massive problems in front of the country. And we need a proper department to monitor these, these activities and counter a plan, a strategy. Right? So this article was also very influential because it was discussed among the, uh, you know, top notches of the state government. This brings me to the third event, which takes place also in 1973, under our very own Sundarlal Bahuguna. Right? And, uh, you know, and a couple of other people as well began the Chipko Andolan in 1973. The Chipko. This is your Uttarakhand, right? This is Kumaon region and this is Garhwal region. Okay? Chamoli mein ye hua tha. This, this entire thing began in Chamoli district, Chamoli of Garhwal. Right? Chandi Prasad Bhatt, he was one of the local leaders who was very dynamic and he really able to, he was really able to unite people to this cause. Chandi Prasad, but I think he has won a Magasase award as well for this, for his contribution, right? Uh, when the, you know, entire thing began, the movement, it was called as Angal Valtha, which is in Kumauni and Garwali language, means to hug. Gradually, it became more Hindi, Chipko, just to make it more appealing to a larger section of people. It was made into Chipko. 
right from angalvatha so uh, you know what was happening let me you know build a slight uh, uh, background here to hota ye raha tha bacche ki the government the state government at that point of time there was no uttarakhand right uttarakhand was created much later this region was under uttar pradesh and the uttar pradesh state government they would issue contracts for felling of trees in this region and these contracts were typically given to uh, the people from the plains and these people from the plains would come in a lot of uh, you know workers and laborers would also come in a lot of tourists would also come in and their entire existence was being uh, questioned the people were not being allowed to cut a couple of trees for their usage their usage which they have been carrying on since ages you will not allow them to collect firewood you would not allow them to take the minor produce of the forest you will not allow them to cut a couple of trees because they have to celebrate their festival because their life is intertwined with this tree with this ecosystem but you will allow contractors from plain region to come and fell hundreds of trees can you understand their angst can you understand their angst so at, at one point at one point at one point in this specific village right rainy village in march 1974 female you know but the, the situation reached a flash point the villagers were lied to and when they were busy somewhere else the male members the contractors they sent their uh, lakhat and henchmen to fell the trees with coercion and at this point this female gora devi she along with a lot of brave females who were a part of mahila mangal dal can you see the determination on their faces one of them is gora devi i have not been able to i believe it's probably she right uh, but yeah these guys they became absolutely uh, belligerent and they said you know if you want you can kill us but these trees are much more precious and we will not allow you to you know, do this finally the people have to let go the government had to take a step back the government had to take a step back government created a committee to look into the matter meanwhile interesting point they go sir it was not that they believe that trees should not be cut they were not environmentalists they were poor people fighting for their right to survive this is why chipko is considered a turning point in the history of global environmentalism iske pehle people thought that environmentalism is a discussion which needs to happen at the dinner table of rich people chipko changed that perception it said no the most vulnerable are those who are the poor people so change the game new researches were conducted the entire strategy changed chipko is considered a landmark in history of global environmentalism uh, rather it was an assertion of their right they said it is our right to cut the tree not yours we have been doing it since ages sustainably and all of a sudden you come and you 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 start dictating terms so it was a very interesting interesting uh, but you know it was more selfish 
after you know uh, as uh, you know the entire the thing became a big deal big deal so a lot of other peasants they started getting inspired by chipko and more and more movements were uh, uh, you know started in the himalayas itself a lot of peasants got together and uh, they repulsed the loggers they cannot the, the loggers were not allowed to cut down the forests chandi prasad bhatt who was the local leader he also started focusing on reconstruction he also started focusing on restructuring you know reconstruction he said we will not be just simply protesting we will also make the situation better high house barren lands lands where already trees have been cut trees were planted you know renewable sources of energy cheap renewable sources renewable sources of energy they were brought into picture micro hydel projects biogas plants right what is the micro hydel project something like this this of course is a biogas plant and uh, if you have seen swades something of that kind that is called as a micro hydel project government established a committee the villagers their stand was uh, you know accepted as correct the hill women they demonstrated their efficacy in this new form of social movement they uh, demonstrated their efficacy another very key understanding that you should have upsc can very well ask you uh, for a comparison between environmentalism in west and environmentalism in east in west environmentalism began you know by work of scientists they came up with reports indicating that you know what the temperature levels are rising uh, the uh, you know forest cover in amazon is declining etc etc in india environmentalism was born out of the protests of these rural communities so their point of genesis is very different following chipko other people also joined in and across india we would notice a lot of people with uh, become very assertive about these community rights right these uh, local regional movements they became a very very frequent in your uh, second half of 70s and 80s they could tribals of chhota nagpur plateau they launched their own struggle on kerala coast artisanal fisher folk right they started protesting against the uh, you know the new large uh, fishers large large trawlers what are trawlers those heavy huge boats to catch a lot of fishes right so these small fishermen who had like one boat a couple of nets etc they started protesting against these large trawlers companies only the companies could afford such large trawlers they would come and destroy the uh, local ecosystem isn't it the fishermen will catch what a dozen fishes but these trawlers they will catch like in one go a thousand fish crazy 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 tribals in gandhamardan in orissa they also started resisting to all the bauxite mining operations which was going on in this region i was having a discussion with dimple dimple uh, you know she she specializes in geography and environment and uh, she was telling me this that this is called as resource curse all right area which is rich in resource you will see a lot of conflicts there there will not be a lot of development there do read something on it if possible do read something on it right uh, 
this is a map wise representation of uh, you know how uh, which were the major movements so to speak just a snapshot chipko hai dekho yahan par right uh, then the you know anti tihri dam movement anti tihri dam movement over river bhagirathi right then we have uh, uh, narmada so against sardar sarovar narmada bachao andolan right then we have uh, this is gandh mardan against bauxite mining right uh, the you know groups opposing kaiga nuclear power plant uh, i have not discussed that aspect i you know i have not discussed that aspect you can talk about that as well apico movement i will speak about it and silent valley movement these are some of the important movements environmental movements right so let's let's take up these and uh, see what we can get right after this i will also give you a phase wise the four phases of indian environmentalism and then we will look at the challenges in front of us that should be a good enough understanding and analysis all right so let's let's keep going this is about apiku no this is about silent valley movement right in the you know silent valley movement if you see this is in kerala right this is in kerala malabar mein kya ho raha hai dekhte hain uh, a hydro electric project it was to be built on this small stream called as kunthi puza river on this river a hydroelectric dam was to be built kunthi puza and uh, the people here they started protesting and they wanted to save this entire uh, you know forest of palakkad district and finally the government accepted and agreed and in 1986 silent valley was declared a national park right uh, a lot of foreign people they also played a very interesting contribution here because some photographers some wildlife researchers they started pointing out in 70s that if you make a dam here then this species lion tailed macaw monkey which is endemic to this region will disappear and uh, so you know as a result the struggle went on for 13 years and finally government said all right we are not going to build this uh, project and in 86 they declared it a national park silent valley national park palakkad district kerala fair uh this is narmada bachao andolan which was spearheaded by one medha patkar and baba amte both wonderful personalities this is the map of a narmada river it passes through gujarat mp and maharashtra right uh as per this thing right uh, the narmada tribunal it had given a go ahead dekh rahe ho bachche 30 major dams were to be constructed are to be constructed and 135 medium and 3000 small dams so do you realize the entire uh basin of the river is uh, going to have a drastic change right uh Sardar Sarovar is the largest of all these dams. Sardar Sarovar is the same dam in front of which Vallabhai Patel's statue has been erected, isn't it? So this is the map of uh, Narmada, and see these are the major dams which are supposed to be constructed here. This is Sardar Sarovar, which is which is going to be the largest of them all, and. Uh, from here itself when sardar sarovar dam the construction began that is where narmada bachao andolan also began 
Because such construction projects, such dam making, the, that requires a lot of you know, flooding of nearby region forests. And the government was not taking adequate care of those concerns. Rehabilitation, adequate compensation, these are just part of the deal. Even they were delayed, even they are delayed. Right, but uh, we really need to do a lot more. So Sardar Sarovar Dam, right? It began, the, you know, the foundation was laid by Jawaharlal Nehru in 1961. And uh, the construction, that was to start in 1987. It did start in 1987, but then Supreme Court, right? It understood what NBA was saying, Narmada Bachao Andolan was saying, and uh, stalled it in 1995. But then government uh, in 2001 started the construction again. And gradually, the height of Sardar Sarovar has also been increased. Medha Patkar while continues to fight for adequate compensation and uh, proper rehabilitation of all the people who, in, who are in a lot of cases come, isn't it, in, in your paper for ethics on such such uh, situations. It's a clear cut balance, right, between uh, Article Twenty One, right to freedom, right to liberty, and your uh, utilitarian ethics. The good of more shall survive, even if it causes pain to some few. In administration, that is a lot of the time a guiding principle. But yes, we cannot make that an excuse. And again, we also need to look at the long-term implications of those projects. Isn't it? So, gradually, the Narmada Bachao Andola, they use you know, very, very innovative ways of protesting. Satyagraha, Jal Samarpan, Gao Band, right? All of them were used. This is Apiko movement, Apiko movement of Uttar Karnataka, right? It began in 1983 in the Kalse forests, where government was cutting a lot of these trees and planting plywood for monoculture. I'm sure you would agree, right? Such monoculture is not same as a forest cover. So people, in 1983, they started protesting. This is known as Apiko movement. And it is also called as South India's Chipko. Apiko in Kannad means to hug. Apiko in Kannar means to hug. All right. This is a Tihiri Dam. This is a Tihiri Dam, uh, which is on uh, uh, Bhagirathi River. It is on Bhagirathi River. Right. It is the tallest dam of India. Bhagirathi and Alaknanda, they together make Ganga, isn't it? And on Bhagirathi, Tihiri Dam was uh, to be built. And uh, a huge anti-Tehiri movement was running from 1980s to 2004. Tehiri is in a seismic zone. Seismic as in earthquakes can occur here. Right, so this is also one of those movements which you can keep in mind, right? Let's have a look at stages of environmentalism. Right? Where in the West, right, green movement was motivated by the desire to keep places beautiful, natural, scenic in India. Environmentalism was driven by desire to survive, a baser instinct. Because, you know, our survival was intertwined with our environment. Right? Uh, so these are a few stages, right, 
of environmentalism. This is as per Ramchandra Guha. Again, uh, 70s, 1970s. Right? This is the stage where, uh, you know what, uh, the concern for environment is considered a luxury, was considered a luxury. Right? At this stage, as you can expect, right, uh, socialism was uh, ruling the day. Indira Gandhi and her emergency. So at this point, the people who would talk of environmental problems, you know, they were, uh, you know, called as uh, a boon suwa. Yeah. You get the point, right? That is for rich people to discuss those things. Right? And this is, a, you know, this is a basically, uh, simply they are trying to fool us. That was the attitude. Right? Uh, Chandi, Chandi Kumar Bisht, right? The, the, the guy, the sweet little guy from uh, Chamole. He was treated and called a KGB, a CIA agent. He is America's CIA agent. He doesn't want us to progress. Right? This is the 70s. In 80s, media attention. Media attention was brought in. Media started uh, talking about these issues. And as a result, government also started taking certain actions. A Department of Environment is established in 1918. Quite late, right? Just 40 years back. In 1980, five years later in 1985, the department is made into a ministry. Ministry of Environment. State governments, they also create ministries of environment. Right? Then early 90s, early 90s, a lot of academic interest is displayed. A lot of academic interests is displayed. A lot of social scientists, other scientists, they all started studying the root causes of these environmental conflict. And finally, after the liberalization, privatization and globalization, once those engines were set into motion, things changed. The environmental activists were now, who have been called as CIA agent, were now, I apologize, were now labeled as KGB agents. You getting my point here? They were now being uh, called KGB agents. Many free, free market ideologues, people who wanted free market to decide everything. They started saying that these green environmentalists, right? They are basically party poopers. They are basically party poopers who are not willing to let India go on a serious high growth trajectory. They are stopping all the projects. They are party poopers. India finally opened economy and these, these buggers are talking about felling trees. Right? You see their attitude. And this ideologue of free market, these ideologues of free market, they got a very, very, very ready audience. How so? The entire consumption-based middle class of India. They loved it. They said, yes. Who cares about environment? The middle class loved it. Their entire middle class is based on the idea of consumption. Conspicuous consumption. And when once the economy was open, they were getting all those goods back into India. And they wanted the same things for India. They were ready to pay the cost. They were ready to pay the cost. 
development at the cost of environment continues. Continues. In India, it continues. As you guys grow up, I'm sure you would realize what kind of shitty work we have done. Your elders. What kind of a screwed up place we are giving you, you will realize. I'm sure you guys have realized by now. Uh, but pretty sure you will realize how revoltingly bad we have done. Tree felling continues. Landslides continue. This is, this is very recent. This is very recent. India has never seen the rise of green groups like Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth. It was never ecology. It was always socio-ecology at work. Our environmental ethic is pro-poor, human-centered. Not nature-centered as in West. The Westerners, they want to save the environment for its sake. For environment's sake. Our sense of environmental ethics is more associated with our survival. Pro-poor, pro-who, human, rather than pro-nature. Each has its own, uh, you know, pluses and minuses. So they try and protect and conserve. We try and utilize utilitarian conservationism. In East, in, 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 our, in our context. Because we are also fighting other battles. Our population is still living below poverty line. So we always have to make some, uh, you know, cost-benefit analysis. So our sense of, our understanding of conservationism is more utility-based. Theirs is more protection-based. Because they can afford it as well. They can spend a billion of dollars on trying to protect a baby seal. Right, we cannot. Now, in this entire tussle, in this entire tussle, some large scale uh, attitudes that we can notice, right, as we try and, uh, uh, you know, environmentalism, if you look at it, right, it has its own set of. Uh, uh, allies, it has its own set of uh, uh, people who are at conflict. Environmentalism, the environmentalists, they typically find their allies in media and judiciary. While uh, their, uh, you know, their uh, antagonists are typically from bureaucracy and political class. So the executive arm, they are typically anti-environmentalists, while the media and the judiciary, they seem to be more pro-environment uh, sort of attitude, generally speaking, generally speaking, right? The, the environment movements which have all grown since 70s, right, Chipko and all, if you look at it, they have done work at three levels. They have done work at three levels or three areas. What are they? They have managed to create awareness about the need to balance environment and growth. That is one aspect which these movements have achieved. Right? They have played a key role in three areas. This is their first achievement. Second, they have managed to oppose development projects which are inimical. Inimical means which are against, you know, uh, larger environmental benefits or societal benefits. For example, Kaiga nuclear plant, people will start to test it. Saying that, you know, uh, the uh, problems, the uh, Tensions created within the local society will be too much. The cost is too much. Take it somewhere else. We do not want it. Third, they have managed to organize model projects which are non-bureaucratic. 
and where people are participating, communities are participating, and they are managed to, they are managing to uh, take care of their nearby immediate environment. So it is in these three areas that uh, the movement seem to have played a very positive role in India. The challenges, the challenges, the biggest challenges, do we have the political will? Do we have the political will to take serious actions against the big polluters and the small polluters as well? Right? Uh, the bureaucracy is at times really, really corrupt and inefficient. So, uh, you know, if let's say I have a project which is absolutely going to cause a lot of damage to the nearby ecosystem, I can pay a bunch of money to uh, one of the bureaucratic uh, idiots and uh, get my work done. Do you realize? Problem, major problem, major, major problem. Okay. Uh, no scientific expertise in this area, no scientific expertise in this area which uh, India can boast of. Within civil society, we do not have enough knowledgeable people who can question the government's uh, understanding and argument. Just like in West, here also, the civil society needs to pressurize the government. And for that, civil society needs to be adequately smart enough. We need to ask the correct question. A lot of other problems keep on happening, right? Uh, the North and South, I mean the Northern Hemisphere countries, or let's call them developed countries and the, you know, other countries. They are also not able to come to a proper understanding. North is hell-bent upon maintaining its hegemony. And uh, South is hell-bent upon saying that you are the one who is responsible for this. And uh, we have also our rights. So, in a nutshell, it's a pretty bleaker situation, pretty bleaker situation. The Western industrial urban model of growth, this is the model of growth which India also has, a, 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 you know, we are, we are also trying to emulate this model, especially after 1991, industrialization, urbanization, making up cities. But all this, it is extremely resource and capital intensive. A lot of natural resources are involved here. A lot of capital is involved here. And so much of resource intensive projects, they are bound to, uh, you know, create problem for all the natural cycles that we see around us. So the bottom line that we can now uh, say is, uh, uh, do the politicians in India, they have, do they have the willpower to actually take on the big polluters? And keep in mind that a lot of their, a uh, lot of the big polluters, all these uh, public distribution companies, etc., they are actually PSUs. So does government have the willpower? to take on these challenges, right? That will determine how we keep looking into it, right? Politicians, they're also not very aggressive against small polluters because, you know, of the entire vote bank politics, which a democracy entails. So judging from all this, I'm sure, probably you will agree that India's electoral democracy has not been able to provide an answer. Right? To manage this challenge. Challenge of pollution. We have not been able to. Why? Because our civil society is not strong enough, not aware enough.
the polluter, the politician, the bureaucrat. Most of the time they are hand in glove. Right? And uh, this creates a lot of problems. The principle which is polluter pays. So if, if I am the one who is polluting, I should be the one who should pay for all the damage which has caused to, which has been caused to the environment. Seems like an okay principle. But the way it has been interpreted is a serious problem. It is somewhere given the attitude pollute and pay. Rather than changing their own habits and ways, those who can afford, they have started splurging, paying and you know, keep on polluting. Rather than swallow the tough pill and change their, the, the way they operate. Right? NGT, National Green Tribunal, was established in 2010. It is definitely a very, very wonderful body. But again, remember, it can only be effective which when it is allowed to work properly and freely and given enough teeth. At times, some very capable men have headed uh, NGT. And they have produced some, uh, you know, uh, uh, awesome decisions as well. But at other times, NGT has also failed miserably to look into the wider concerns. All right. And this is how probably things stand at this point of time. It is our civil society which has to unify. We will have to literally browbeat because this is precisely what happened in the West. In 60s and, you know, 1960s, I was telling you, Tom, you know, Thames, Ryan, they all were sewers. And then it took them 20 years to change the situation. At this point of time, we are, uh, you know, at the same place where West was in 1960s. Our attitude is probably just the same. Let us see how it changes. Let us see how it evolves. I would also welcome you to, uh, you know, uh, drop in your own comment, your own thought here. Right? And uh, keep watching this space. Dekhte raho. Jaisa lag raho ho, mujhe batate raho. And uh, happy learning. Bye.